Hello everyone, welcome back to the latest lecture session. Uh, Let us get uh, right into it. We were discussing generic aspects until now. We looked at the video of the IIT Roorkee sewage treatment plant just to you know get your juices flowing, right? And uh, now we are going to get into the crux of the issue, right? So, wastewater treatment, right? What is it that I am trying to uh, do or degrade? So, I have uh, water that is high in total suspended solids, has some dissolved solids, total dissolved solids, the sum of which will be total solids. And typically the issue is that it will have a lot of organic content, right? Organic content, let us say CHO, right? XYZ documentary. And thus, when I release into the oceans, what is going to happen to this organic content? Uh, not oceans, pardon me, the surface water bodies or such. You know, it will undergo degradation and how is it? It is going to use the most common electron acceptor out there, which is oxygen. And then the microbes are going to lead to or try to, you know, achieve this particular uh, reaction. Why is that? They want to get the relevant energy that will be released from this redox reaction. This is nothing but redox reaction. Carbon relatively reduced form is now being uh, oxidized or mineralized to carbon dioxide. In this process, the compound, not compounds, the bacteria are going to get the energy. So, that is going to happen in nature. That is what you see when you throw your waste out or such, right? If it is anaerobic, it is going to start to smell too, right? So, that is uh, one aspect to keep in mind. But again, this is an aerobic process as in being done in the presence of oxygen. So, if I let it out or the waste, untreated waste into the uh, uh, river or uh, surface water body or such, leave aside, you know, effects on humans, it is obviously going to lead to the collapse of the aquatic ecosystem. Other than that, you know, the relevant uh, pathogens will be recycled back into our own uh, uh, drinking water uh, supplies and we are going to be affected and such, let us say, right? So, that is something that we already see. So, what do I want to remove in general? I obviously want to remove this organic content. I also want to try to kill the pathogens or make them inactive, let us say. But here I have organic content in the form of some suspended solids, some uh, dissolved solids also, right? They will be dissolved and some of it can also be suspended and then you can have inert material also, right? So, organic content present both in the form of dissolved organics and suspended organics and also I want to take care of the pathogens. So, how do I uh, do that here? So, we have a schematic out here. You might have seen at least in India, let us say, manholes overflowing and such. Other than poor design, one reason that uh, leads to such choking of manholes and such is that, you know, people dump a lot of uh, inert waste. One example is uh, dumping of uh, plastics, let us say, and that chokes up your pipeline or sewerage network and then you are going to have overflow or such. So, you know, it is on our hands, that is something to note. And so, all those bigger particles, branches, leaves and such, we want to remove using the bar screens. If not, they are going to affect your other machinery down the line in your wastewater treatment plant. And then grit and again uh, relatively bigger uh, particles, let us say and such, you want to remove them or take care of them out here, let us say, right? Easy to remove and they uh, and such. Then you are going to have particles that will or can settle down by gravity, but can take a lot of time. So, you can add a coagulant and flocculant. But in wastewater treatment, typically they do not add coagulant flocculant, but some people do. And then you are going to lead to have or settling of your uh, relatively heavier particles here at the bottom. And that goes to sludge thickening. We looked at the video uh, in last session, where at the end of the video, I showed you a particular filter press, where the sludge that was collected from that uh, aeration tank of that particular sewage treatment plant that you know it settles down, right? It is heavier, it settles down and that goes to this uh, sludge thickener because you want to decrease the volume and the uh, what is it now increase the density let us say, right? And uh, such so it goes to the sludge thickener. So, here what is it that we are trying to do here? Here we are trying to remove as much suspended solids as you can, right? Primarily suspended solids. Along with this process obviously, some of the organic content is also going to be removed. So, here we will have let us say maybe 30 percent BOD, but considerable removal of suspended solids. 
after that you still have a lot of organics again i just used the term bod it is biochemical oxygen demand so it's nothing but what do we say a way of understanding how much organic content is there in the water sample but we are trying to look at it in terms of oxygen demand as in how much oxygen will this particular uh, waste or the organics in that waste uh, oxygen demand how much will that exert let us say right how much oxygen will it be uh, consuming right in that terms we are going to look at it biochemical oxygen demand why is that again because if I dump it they dump this waste into the nature it is going to consume the oxygen. So, BOD will give me an idea about how much oxygen can be consumed right biochemical oxygen demand indirect indicator of the organic content let us say right. We uh, will look at how to conduct this BOD test later but I just want to mention that and then we have this activated sludge biological treatment activated sludge uh, what is all this sludge if you remember I put in a beaker right and uh, this was after aeration and after some time you had relatively clear water at the top and most of the sludge or the bacteria settled down to the bottom let us say right. So, that is this is what we are referring to as sludge. So, what is the role or uh, why do we need this uh, sludge and why do we need to activate it. For example, you see that after this aeration treatment here or aeration zone it goes to the secondary settling and then the sludge is settled down that is what you saw in the beaker the settled sludge is uh, some of it is recycled back into the uh, what is this aeration uh, basin let us see aeration tank why is that because the uh, waste that is coming in the waste that is coming in let us say does not have you know the waste that is coming in here does not have enough microbial content let us see. So, the kinetics of your particular uh, degradation of organics is going to be relatively uh, slow. So, you want to increase the concentration of the microbes that are present in your aeration basin right. So, that is why you are going to recycle some of this settled sludge from here back into the aeration tank and the other obviously goes into that sludge thickening and after that it goes for sludge digestion or composition before being given to farmers or used as fertilizer right. So, this is the biological process out here where most of the BOD is degraded. If nutrient removal as in nitrogen and phosphorus removal is also required that you will have another stage here or you can tinker with this biological process right here to remove nitrogen and such. And then chlorination typically you uh, now people are moving away from chlorination of at least uh, treated wastewater why is that because you have harmful disinfection byproducts but we will not discuss this now. Chlorination or disinfection is carried out why is it you are going to have to take care of the pathogens here, right. So, that is why you have chlorination you can have UV for disinfection right and such. So, that is something to keep in mind let me just get a given overview of what we have out here. So, preliminary treatment where you know plastics, tree leaves, branches and such are removed out here bar screens and grid chamber we will have good pictures and such later. Primary settling relatively bigger particles uh, quite a few wastewater treatment plants uh, sometimes do away with this primary uh, treatment ok. And then you have the biological uh, process let us say again here we have to have the sludge but for uh, the sake of easier understanding I removed it out here. So, here biological process where most of the uh, BOD or the organic content is removed out here and here most of the suspended solids are removed and here most of the pathogens are removed. So, as you see primary treatment, secondary treatment and then disinfection sometimes you will have tertiary treatment if you also want to remove nitrogen and phosphorus let us say right. So, that is something to uh, keep in mind out here primary and secondary. In India mostly uh, we have only up to secondary treatment as even if we had a sewage treatment plant in the first case we only have it until uh, the uh, secondary treatment and typically they are poorly run why is that lack of uh, knowledge. And again people think that you know microbes are like a machine. So, you can uh, you know treat them poorly during the night and in the morning they are going to wake up and do the job that is not how they work right they are similar to maybe humans or any other living organisms 
you care, take care of them, the system thrives, right? A good, uh, what do we say, microbial population is going to thrive and then you are going to have a well-functioning uh, sewage treatment plant. Microbes again, living organisms, right? You do not, uh, what do we say, you look after them, they are not going to be able to do what it is that the plant was designed for. So that is one thing that we always see in our uh, wastewater treatment plants. And another thing is that, you know, especially in those cases where industries are connected to the relevant common effluent treatment plant and such, what do industries do? They are supposed to pre-treat it so that at least some of the more toxic and hazardous chemicals are removed before the waste is sent to the sewage treatment plants, not sewage, common effluent treatment plants and such, which are typically based on the same principles that we see here. But what do they do in the night? They just let all the toxic, uh, you know, very low pH waste or high heavy metal laden waste or, uh, you know, inorganic laden waste into the relevant stream that ends up coming in contact with your bacteria. The bacteria can't do the job or they die, let us say, right? And again, it leads to ruin of the plant and that happens quite often in India. But hopefully people will realize that we are shooting ourselves in our own foot, let us say, right? Or you people listening to this class will now act as relatively more aware and knowledgeable citizens. So, we looked at wastewater and in water, what is it that I am concerned about? So, in water, at least in theory, the issue is that we presume that the organic content is relatively less, okay? But again, this is in theory, in India that does not turn out to be the case, especially when water treatment is from surface body, water bodies like rivers or lakes, let us say, okay? So, we assume that organic content is less and then what is it that uh, we are trying to remove. We are trying to remove suspended solids if there are any, right? And then we are going to try to kill the pathogens. So, that is what we are going to achieve. So, suspended solids, how do we remove that? As I mentioned, you know, preliminary treatment, bar screens and such, we are not going to discuss this. So, we can have uh, just particles settling by gravity, let us see, right? We had the example of a uh, bottle of or glass of water and particles or soil, you know, put into that particular glass of water and after some time, you know, most of it settling down, but still some particles will be out there, let us say, right? Because they take more time, let us say. Again, different types of settling, we will come back to that later. So, uh, here we will let gravity do the job for these particles, but what about these particles, let us say? How do I get rid of or how do I, you know, get these particles which are relatively small in size but can still be uh, removed or, you know, can still be, uh, uh, what do we say, pulled down by gravity if I may say so, but will take a lot of time. What will I do? I have these flocks, right, and they are going to have a charge on it, let us say, and I am going to try to neutralize the uh, charge here, right. Typically, they have a negative charge and that is why they repel each other. So, I am going to add a coagulant, let us say, typically that will uh, have, a, what do we say, positive charge, let us say, that is going to or can release positive charged ions, let us say, Fe2+, plus, not Fe2+, plus, typically Fe3+, plus, let us say, or Al3+, plus or such, let us say, right. Uh, charge is going to be neutralized out here, right. The surface charge is going to be neutralized and then the particles can, this is a plus, I am trying to write, it looks like a 4 here because of uh, the way that I seem to be using the pen. So, then the particles can come together, they can uh, coagulate, let us say, right? And then bigger particles, they can, uh, what is it now, be removed by sedimentation. So, first you are going to add a coagulant, right? Fe3 plus or Al3 plus. So, you are going to have rapid mixing and coagulation, coagulation, right, when you are neutralizing the surface charge and then you are going to have flocculation when these particles come together and form flocks. Here, you are not going to mix it rapidly because if you mix it rapidly, these particles are, go, you know, shear, I guess, right. Uh, you, they are not going to form flocks. So, here you are going to have gentle mixing, right, gentle mixing. And then once you form the bigger particles and then you are going to stop stirring and you know you are going to have sedimentation, right? And obviously, you need to treat the residuals. And then you are also going to have, let us say, a relatively other uh, smaller particles which cannot be removed even by sedimentation. So, you want to have, let us say, different filtration, um, uh, what do we say, uh, process or techniques. 
one common uh, way of filtration is by using a sand filter right there are different kinds sand filter uh, relatively common let us say right. Again obviously if you do not do this and use a sand filter directly yes you can but keep in mind that your sand filter is going to be choked very often. So what happens is you know it is not as if let us say the size is 20 micrometers or 30 micrometers and everything above 30 will be stopped everything below 30 will go down it does not work like that. You will typically also have a biofilm developing on your sand and it is not just training let us say sometimes uh, you know the biofilm will adsorb and degrade some of the organic content here and such and the size of this particular pore also decreases you are going to have straining and other aspects. So relatively smaller particles also can be removed let us say right. So sand filtration and um, what have I been doing until now I have been removing the suspended solids until now. And then obviously the final step before I send it to the water distribution network is that I have to remove the pathogens let us say right. So that is why I disinfect it typically either Cl2 or HOCl right source of uh, oxidizing agents both are oxidizing agents. Nowadays people are going to uh, UV and rarely also ozonation. Ozonation why because it can oxidize the organic content present if any without uh, leading to formation of harmful or carcinogenic disinfection, disinfection by products. With when you use Cl2 or HOCl though you can lead to formation of disinfection by products right. So that is something to uh, keep in mind we will uh, look at this. This is for general water treatment but obviously as I mentioned we will also look at ion exchange and uh, what else I think uh, different kinds of ultra filtration and so on and so forth let us say right. So this is for surface water treatment let us move on and see what it is that I have out here. So the content we are going to discuss over the next couple of sessions that is what we have out here. So obviously we need to look at and understand concentrations and material flows we will just touch upon that and obviously material balance I request everyone and urge everyone rather to pay great, great attention to material balance you know you will use this at least environmental engineers will use this a lot uh, you know when if and when they go to uh, pursue masters or uh, PhD. And uh, at least in this class also we will be using it a lot in the wastewater treatment related aspects let us see if not in water treatment right let us see what it is that I have. So with respect to concentrations we can express this in uh, different ways let us say I have this right. So A moles react with B moles of B A moles of A react with B moles of B to form these moles right. So I can express the uh, you know sometimes concentration is at least in air is expressed in terms of mole ratio right that is something. Mole I guess right what is it Avogadro's number of uh, these compounds 10 power 23 right that is based on trying to see that the molecular mass and the mass in Dalton's is the same. So mole sometimes people use that but typically in water or waste water we do not use that a loss, lot pardon me right. And another aspect is mass so either milligrams of the compound per gram or such or milligram per kg or such let us say right. Or let us say sometimes uh, though I have written it as volume here I will also use it in terms of uh, amount per volume as in I can have mole per liter right right so that the unit is molar units let us say moles per liter let us say right and with respect to uh, mass sometimes we come across different kinds of units like this milligram per liter let us say mass per volume right moles per volume mass per volume I typically would like to write it as mass per volume because it helps me in understand it understanding but again uh, different ways for different persons let us say right milligram per liter let us say. And 1 liter of water let us say if I am dealing with water and assuming the density to be what now 1 kg per uh, liter let us say milligram per kg. Here when I write it this way people will be confused so the way I write it is let us say if I am talking about calcium let us say. So I have milligrams of calcium let us say 100 milligrams of calcium per liter of water right per liter of water. So mass per volume of water. So if I say it is uh, you know 1 liter 
weighs 1 kg, let us say 1 litre of water. So, 100 milligrams of calcium per kg of water, let us say, right. So, here milli, milli is 10 power minus 3 grams, kg is 10 power 3 grams, right, of calcium in H2O, right, or in water. So, this what does this end out to be? This comes out to be 100 into 10 power minus 6 or let me write it this way in the denominator 10 power 6 let us say right per H2O. So, this unit is 10 power 6 and a million is also 10 power 6 right. So, 1 by 10 power 6 is nothing but 1 part per million right 1 in 1 by 10 power 6 is nothing but 1 part in a million 1 part per million right. So, that is something to keep in mind. So, this unit can also be written as 100 ppm Ca2 plus concentration. So, that is something to keep in mind. Similarly, instead of 1 by 10 power 6 if we have 1 by 10 power 9. So, billion 1 billion is 10 power 9. So, it is equal to 1 part per billion let us say right 1 part per uh, billion let us say. So, that is something to keep in mind different uh, ways of expressing it. So, one is uh, with respect to moles we have molar in typically when we are talking about chemistry and relevant conversions we talk about uh, molar basis, but for the layman typically they understand it better in terms of mass per volume in as in milligram per liter. Rarely do we express it in terms of volume. Sometimes especially when we are talking about hardness or such we express it in terms of equivalence. So, when we say equivalent what is it that we are talking about? Let us say I have uh, let us say uh, some apples and you have some oranges you know how do I you know go about uh, getting the oranges I want and giving you the apples or such that uh, you want. So, we need to think of it in terms of equivalent. So, one equivalent can be the cost of or the price of let us say set of apples let us say. So, we are talking about money here. So, we are talking about equivalents in terms of money. So, I will give you let us say 100 rupees equivalent of uh, market value uh, worth of apples and you will give me 100 rupees worth of or equivalent uh, worth of uh, oranges here. So, similarly here let us say equivalent. So, we need to express it in terms of uh, equivalents or some equivalent. So, typically it can be in terms of how much H plus is given out or can be taken equivalent in terms of H plus equivalent in terms of what is it uh, electrons equivalent in terms of electrons and most usually used in this with respect to charge let us say. So, equivalents in terms of charge as in you would have seen with respect to hardness or such we would have expressed rather than writing it uh, as C A 2 plus we write it as this is 2 plus 2 plus we write it as C A C O 3 equivalent C A C O 3 right. So, we will look at these conversions and such later. So, that is one aspect to uh, keep in mind right. For example, uh, calcium molecular weight how much is that uh, 40 I guess right 40 grams per mole right and with respect to CaCO3 40 plus 12 plus 3 into 16. So, this is 48 and 60. So, that is going to be equal to 100 grams per mole let us say. Here if we are looking at it with respect to charge and positive charge at Ca2 plus and CO3 2 minus let us say right. So, plus 2 uh, charge out here right. So, based on that you can calculate the equivalent weight right. So, if I have let us say 2 equivalents uh, per mole let us say right. How what will the equivalent weight be? It will be 100 grams per mole by 2 equivalents per mole right. So, that is going to be equal to 100 by 2 gram per mole into mole per equivalent. So, that is going to be equal to 50 gram per equivalent let us say right. So, in that way you can convert it I always suggest that you write it in terms of this equivalence let us say right. So, that is something to keep in mind similarly you can write it for calcium and once you have it in terms of 
what do we say equivalence you can uh, get it done accordingly let us say right ok ok. So, uh, let us cover the next aspect. So, concentrations we sometimes look at conversions I mean one aspect is let us say milligram per gram right. So, 10 power minus 3 gram per gram then right or ml per liter or micro liter per liter right. So, you have to use these relevant conversions let us say conversion factors 10 power minus 3, 10 power minus 6 and so on and so on forth let us say right or liter and meter cube and different conversions. Then there is the other kind uh, the type conversion about which I already talked about. For example, molecular weight let us say you know mass uh, per mole mass per mole of that relevant uh, compound let us say. For calcium we just saw that it is going to be equal to 40 grams of calcium per 1 mole of that relevant uh, compound let us say right. So, that is something that we already looked at. Similarly, equivalent weight how will we get that? That is molecular weight for example, again with calcium 40 gram per mole let us say right into let us say calcium 2 charge here the equivalents are with respect to charge let us say. So, 2 equivalents per or divided by right it has to be uh, divided by is not it? 2 equivalents per uh, mole let us say. So, we have the equivalent weight out here 20 grams per equivalent I guess right. So, again this should have been divided not uh, multiplied by right. So, accordingly you can calculate the equivalent weight and get it done and obviously uh, density, but we do not use that a lot, lot again the units of density are mass per volume right. Typically we assume that the densities are same with respect to time and space at least in the aspects that we consider out here let us say right. So, let us uh, move on this is with respect to equivalents. Uh, before I move on let us say uh, sorry about that we had CaCO3 the equivalent weight was 50 gram per equivalents let us say. So, now for calcium you had it in terms of uh, 20 gram per equivalents let us say. So, let us say if you have concentration of uh, calcium to be uh, let us say 100 milligram per liter right. So, you can convert it into equivalents in the first case right and then use that to convert it into equivalents in the form of uh, CaCO3. Do I have space here let us just write that out. I have CaCO3 the equivalent uh, weight was supposed to be 50 gram per equivalent. And again here we are talking about charge keep that in mind equivalent in terms of charge and for Ca2 plus we said that it was going to be 20 gram per equivalent let us see right. And the concentration let us say I have is 50 milligrams of Ca2 plus per liter of this water. So, here I want to convert this into uh, equivalents here. So, what do I do? So, I guess you see the units out here I want it in terms of equivalent. So, I can divide it by this particular uh, value this particular value because it is of uh, calcium let us say. So, into uh, 1 equivalent per 20 grams of Ca2 plus right. So, now I will have it in terms of milli equivalents per liter, but I want to express it as CaCO3 right. So, again I will have to multiply it by this value. So, I have 50 grams of CaCO3 per equivalent. So, let us see what the units will turn out to be. I first have 100 by 20 into 50 right milli that is 10 power minus 3. So, this is what I have. So, grams of calcium. So, grams of calcium and grams of calcium they cancel out equivalents equivalents cancel out. So, what are the units I end I am ending up with as CaCO3 or CaCO3 per liter let us say right. So, from that I guess 20 into 5 550s are 250 because we already took uh, what is this uh, ok 250 instead of 10 power minus 3 I will write milligram as CaCO3 per liter. So, that is what we have we just converted 100 milligrams of Ca2 plus per liter 
and we express this in terms of as CaCO3 or in terms of uh, CaCO3, right? 100 milligram is equivalent in terms of uh, 250 milligrams of CaCO3. Obviously, knowing these uh, equivalent weights and such, you can also uh, you know get it done in a faster manner. But I wanted to show you the way to get it done without any confusion or such, especially if you write the units in terms of milligrams of calcium, one equivalent per 20 grams of calcium and so on and so forth. So, different uh, changes in units. But let us say if I wanted it in molar units, let us say I have 100 milligrams of liter of calcium and I want the units in molar units let us say right molar units. What do I do? So, molecular weight I know that it is 40 grams of calcium per mole let us say right. So, I want this to be cancelled out. So, I have to divide it by uh, this molecular weight. I want the grams to be cancelled out and moles in the numerator. So, 40 milligrams of Ca2 plus per liter into or divided by the molecular weight right. So, that will be 100 by 40. So, this grams of Ca2 plus grams of Ca2 plus cancel out moles comes to the numerator right. So, milli moles per liter right 10 by 4 I guess is 2.5 milli mole milli mole per liter is nothing but capital M molar units I guess right molar units it is nothing but mole per liter right. So, that is something to keep in mind and one aspect is obviously as we mentioned earlier when we are talking about uh, stoichiometry or such you have to use uh, you have to use uh, what do we say the molar units that is always going to make it easier if not you cannot use this mass units right why is that again here the units uh, the reactions are in terms of molar units out here right. Uh, A moles react with C moles to form D moles right. So, if it is per volume we are obviously going to see that in terms of molar units out there right. So, let us move on what else do we have. So, convergence we will just talk about this diagram and we will move on. Let us say I have mass, I have moles and I have equivalents. Right. So, how can I interconnect or interconvert pardon me. So, mass to uh, moles I need to have the molar mass either divide or multiply and here I will have to have the equivalent weight or the equivalent uh, mass and here I will have to have equivalents per mole let us say right. So, in that way I can convert from one unit to the other. So, I just wanted to mention that. So, we will move on to looking at uh, mass balances as in let us say here I have it at a bigger scale. For example, I want to understand the concentration of a pollutant within this urban air shed which covers the city or let us say if a pollutant or compound is coming into this lake and going out from this way or it is not going out but can be degraded inside this lake. How is the concentration of that compound changing with time? Or if this river is flowing and the sewage is coming in out here and if this is flowing in this direction what is the concentration downstream let us say 10 kilometers how do I calculate that. Or more pertinently for your wastewater treatment plant you saw that you have an aeration tank what is coming in your organics are coming in typically we use the term substrate, substrate is coming in. You are also recycling your microbes right X is also coming in right but that is just recycle though that is something to keep in mind. Then we are going to have the relevant reaction out here. So, how long do I need to you know run this uh, system or more or less how much volume is it that I need to design this tank for. So, how will I get this only by applying mass balance, but I see we are out of time. So, I do not want to uh, start this uh, important topic right now. Uh, once again thanking you for your uh, patience I will end today's session.